Greetings everybody. Welcome to the latest edition of Heart Talk HR. I'm your host, Mihai Noid. At Heart Talk HR, I bring you some fresh ideas and new inspirations from around the world of work where I'm speaking to thought leaders and subject matter experts. Today, my guest will be Maggie Evans. Maggie is the author of From Talent Management to Talent Liberation, available now, a practical guide for professionals, managers, and leaders. And Maggie and I shall be talking about why we need a new approach to talent management who should be owning the talent function, and last but not least, how talent liberation can help in talent retention. I hope you will enjoy today's episode, and if you do, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Part of KJR, we bring you fresh ideas and inspiring content from around the world of work. Maggie, good to have you here. Welcome to the Hot Talk HR latest edition. It's a real privilege uh, having you on the show. Uh, let me start by asking, uh, in your book, endorsed by Dave Ulrich, and here it is, if somebody wants to grab, get a copy, it's out now. Uh, Dave Ulrich said that HR is not about HR. HR is about helping business win. And in your book, you argue that we need a new approach to talent management. Talent mm-hmm. management, the way we know it, the way we work in, with talents is just not working. So let's come up with a new term, and it's called Talent Liberation, what's your, what's your title of your book. Could we explore, so what, are some of the, uh, what are some of the forces that shape uh, the way we work? And more importantly, what are the limitations you've seen in talent management that actually do call for a new approach? Mm, absolutely. It's, we're living in a really interesting time in terms of the changes in the workplace, and I'm sure we've all come across the sort of fourth industrial revolution and the ideas of 100-year life and technological changes and things like that so it's quite interesting to piece all of those together and think well what's the implication of that for talent management and I've identified I sort of summarize it as five key things that are changing in the world of work so we've got sort of macro structures in terms of the way that organizations interact with each other some of the sort of smaller niche organizations coming through that go direct to customer and consumer like uber and airbnb and people And also then some of the macro structures in terms of outsourcing, offshoring and and things like that. So that's having one impact. And then internally, organisations are looking to do things differently. There's much more emphasis that I'm sure we're all seeing in terms of project working, collaboration. So some of those distinctions between functional lines are no longer there in the same way got technological changes so people no longer need to be located in co-located but work well in the same team and then some of the demographic changes with the hundred year life with different generations in working together in the workplace and also people's expectations of a career are changing so whereas in the past people might have been very happy to stay with one organization for life actually now purpose of the organization seems to be much more of a driver all of those five changes sort of changes interact and have massive implications in terms of talent management so whereas before we would be able to say well actually when I started out I know that there's going to we're going to need this many apprentices because we know we've got that many engineers leaving at the end so actually you had quite a structured stable environment you could set your five-year plan and be confident that you'd get there but now it's much more fluid and a lot of the things that we use in talent management were actually developed back in the 1950s. So they were developed for this stable world where you could do succession planning for five years because actually you knew people were likely to stay in the rest of it. We're no longer in that world. You used to know what sort of jobs would exist, but with technology and AI and robotics, we're not quite sure how it's going to all turn out. So actually our needs are very different and the tools that were right for a stable environment just don't really fit for the modern era. Very good insight. Thank you for that. And so it seems like we need to question our paradigms and just need to challenge the, challenge the status quo if we want to uh, successfully move forward. Um, Absolutely. That, that, that pops in my mind a question. Uh, last year, we had a keynote speaker, Vishen Lakhiani. Vishen wrote a book, uh, The Code of the Extra Human Mind, and Vishen coined a term called rules, which are so-called bullshit rules, pardon my French. But basically what it says is that we have so many, either in the very often locked in our subconscious, uh, rules yeah. that are enforced on us by society, by expectation of teacher, parents, or in a workplace. 
And we don't even question those rules. We just accept mm -hmm. those rules. And this, therefore, they become rules. Now, I'm sure that you are, as an international sort of consultant, advisors, work with companies uh, around the world. What are the, some of the rules you've seen in companies that actually call for a new approach? And, and talent liberation can be the answer for breaking those rules there's a huge lack of critical thinking about what we're actually trying to achieve in talent management and so there's an implicit rule that we need to be doing it but few people actually step back from that rule and say why what is it we're really trying to achieve there was a wonderful quote from an hr director i was speaking with and she said we've got so wrapped up in the process we've forgotten about the purpose so one of the rules is it's all about process. And often when you talk to HR directors, say, tell me about your talent management. It's we use nine box. We do succession planning. We establish who's high potential. And actually what we need to be doing is changing that to talk about instead of those are the rules of talent management, what's the purpose? And so totally reframe, reframing that. And I've in the book, I've sort of gave it a lot of thought. A lot of these thinking, this, these thoughts were developed while walking the dog in the woods uh, to think about, you know, what are the key is challenges that we've got with talent management that we need to rewrite the rules on. And I identified five things that actually can then be addressed through a talent liberation approach. So one of the rules we seem to or assumptions that we seem to make is that talent is scarce. And that's a fear that's been fed to us from the media a lot of the time. But actually, when you look underneath some of those data, it's not as clear cut as it would seem. And lots of organisations are experiencing a problem with ready now talent. But that doesn't mean to say they haven't got enough talent. What it does mean to say is we need to look differently. We need to look at different populations. We need to look at uh, where we can find that talent from and how we can build it to meet our, our future needs. So the first thing is a rule that says talent is scarce and therefore there's a battle for it. I would say actually, it's not nearly as scarce as we think. Ready now talent might be in short supply, but actually we've got a huge amount of talent around the world that we can tap into if we become smarter at it. And in the book, I refer to the first woman doctor back in, in the UK in 1864. And now most, and she was the, first one to get qualified and then for a long time there were very few women doctors now certainly in the UK it's more women than men are qualifying as doctors I'd suggest women haven't suddenly become much more talented at being medics but now they've got the opportunities and we've got lots of other populations around the world that we're not actually giving the opportunities to and if we give those opportunities hey presto we end up with more talent so there's a big diversity and inclusion agenda in terms of actually helping more people to be seen as talented to use what their raw material is and to develop it better so mindset of scarcity is one one rule another one is the cult of individual heroes and that's really sort of been around since the early 2000s the idea that you've got the star performer this is the person who can come in and can solve our problems and actually in the academic circles, a lot of that was challenged back with Jeffrey Pfeffer, um, who also wrote something on bullshit rules. Um, and he talked about uh, talent management being hazardous for the organization's health. And a lot of it was based on the idea that an individual is where your talent lies. If that's the case, then actually your competitors can easily come along and steal that person. So it's not a very good model for a business. And actually, when you look at performance, yes, individuals do make a difference. The right leader in the right place is crucial. And so is having the right team. And yet often we get sucked into so much effort on the individual and the high potentials, we forget about setting teams up for success. And that's what will drive a lot of our competitive advantage. So the second one is the cult of individual heroes. The, the third one, the strategic clarity changing world of work and that we can the rule is that we can predict what we need in the future and some of it i'm sure we can but the number of succession plans i've seen that are mapping out five years hence and yet if you look back over the last five years the roles and structures of the organization and what you need from people is very very different so the assumption that actually we can be clearly de defining what we need for the future is i think a bit a bit fake and what we need to do instead is look much more at the agile movement and say what are the different sorts of skills we need what is the sort of culture where might we need to be developing things how do we build agility into our organization so according to whichever scenario plays out we're ready for it and that's actually going to be much more of a driver of 
competitive advantage and risk management than is having a very clearly defined five-year plan that probably won't actually play out in that way. So that's the, the third one, the strategic clarity. Fourth one is most talent management, as I've alluded to earlier, is about process instead of purpose. And actually, when you look at how to unleash people's talent, a lot of it is the culture and the climate that's set in within the organization. The practices of does my manager sit down with me and help me to be at my personal best? Do I actually have a set of where I can take risks, where I can learn things, where if I make a mistake, it's used as a learning opportunity rather than something to beat me over the head with? So that whole culture and informal climate is a massive part of talent management, but doesn't often feature. So it's another of those rules. If we focus on the process, it'll be right. Whereas with talent liberation, I say actually it's about the informal talent climate as well as the formal talent process. And the fifth one is really interesting. When you talk about talent management, it's always from the organization's point of view. What does the organization want? What does the organization need? Yet a few minutes ago when we were talking about changes in the world of work, we look at people's careers and actually what we need is to find a way of meeting the two together. What does the organization need, want to need and what does the individual want to need? Because then you've got a partnership. And it's interesting that within the academic literature as well, there's been very little bringing together of talent management and career development and yet they're both sides of the same coin. So we need to think about you know, how to fact feature the individual as a key stakeholder within this. So five, five sort of key rules that I can see, the um, mindset of scarcity, cult of individual heroes, lack of strategic clarity, the dominance of formal process, and then the final one, missing half the story because it's not paying attention to the individual. So those are some rules that I see that we apply implicitly with talent management and they blinker our thinking. And actually when we start to challenge some of those boundaries, we start to open up very new possibilities for liberating talent instead of managing it. Ah, fantastic views. I especially enjoyed the last one you mentioned. Let's look at what, how, let's not just look at it, not from just from the organization point of view, but look at it from the individual point of view. And probably even we can go one step further, not just look at the career management, but also there is life outside of work. Yeah. So how can organization can help the individual to feel, feel uh, his life, not just work life, but overall, overall life. So that's sort of a partnership when, when you don't have this on the organization, you're the employee kind of yeah. a parent, parent to child approach, but more of really as a true Absolutely. making leadership work as a partnership. I hope uh, we will we'll help some of the viewers to, to start looking at time from this point of view. Yeah, and if you think about the, all of the changes in the world of work, a lot of your talent may never be employed by you anymore. So another boundary you to put, you know, and a lot of talent management is just the people that are employed by the organization. But actually, if you take much more of a partnership approach, it might work for me to work freelance. It might work for me because I have caring responsibilities to do a different way or to work in a different country for six months of the year. And actually, if you say it's about partnership, then you open your opportunities up to very different ways of working with people that may not be the traditional, you are employed, five days a week, so many hours a week, but you can look at the whole life. Absolutely. And while we're talking about partnership, uh, you've mentioned the five uh, points, many of them involves the organization, many of them involves teams, and of course the individuals as well, and you've mentioned whether the person should feel that, hey, my leader actually cares about me, my immediate, mm. manager, immediate supervisor uh, cares about me as a person, as, as one of the question in Gallup's, uh, Gallup's question. Now, where, what is the responsibility of HR and the responsibility of non-HR? I, I, call, I wouldn't want to call them business because I think we need to step mm. away from the fact that HR yeah. and business, HR is business. So let's talk about it's all business and an HR function is part of a significant part of business. But what is the responsibility of HR and the non-HR function when it comes to liberating talent? Yeah, I think if you take as a premise the purpose of talent management or talent liberation is about increasing value in the organisation. Uh, and there's a, an academic and practitioner called Heba Makram, and she's written about different sorts of value. So it's, you know, is it talent management is about value creation, it's about value capture, leverage, and also managing the risk. So that side of things as well. So it's the agenda of talent is all about 
the organization and everyone in it. So as you say, it's not just, you know, it's HR and the business people, it's everyone together has a shared agenda. But it's typically set up in organizations that HR are making requests of the business. And HR, and I've been there, I've been in senior HR roles, it gets hugely frustrating when the business don't listen and they don't do what we're asking. One person said to me, it's taken blood, sweat and tears to get career development plans for 30 people. And we're now saying we want to do it across the organisation. And it's really, really difficult. And I think a lot of it is because of the language that we use is about our processes and what we're demanding and requiring, rather than actually taking much more of a design thinking approach and saying, okay, there are our stakeholders. And maybe doing things like empathy maps, which are in design thinking to say, what is it that's going on for them? What's the pain that they're experiencing and what's the potential gain that they can get by working with this on this with me? And once you've actually got into their shoes, then you can start to talk in a language that will help to create a shared agenda. So we've spoken about partnership with the individual, but it has absolutely has to be partnership with people in the business as well. So I think that design thinking can help to shift the, the conversations that you have with people. But there's also often in businesses, there are some people doing it brilliantly. And it's great to find those people and treat those as early adopters. So thinking about what is it they're doing? How can we help them to promote it? So rather than it being an HR message out to the business, it's colleagues saying, this is what I do. This is how it helps me. And that can be a very powerful way of getting more people from that sort of early adopter box into this sort of getting the, the more adopters and getting the majority of line managers to, to shift over. I think there's another thing that's really interesting, which is looking at what is it the organisation is already doing that's undermining this? Because lots of organisations that I work with are very much targeting people on quarterly targets or monthly targets or sometimes weekly targets. And while people are being measured, rewarded on just those very short term things, see a benefit and to have an incentive to take a much longer term approach. And if you're talking about building your own talent, that doesn't happen overnight. So we need to think about what is it that's going on within the system that might be undermining our attempts to do something around this and then looking at how can we balance it? How can we reward people if they are great exporters of talent around the organisation? How can we reward people for developing their team members? And often at the moment, retention is seen as something that's quite you know, a bad thing. So if you've got a low retention rate, that's something to just to actually avoid but actually it may be a sign that somebody's really good at developing their talent so we need to just sort of question and think about how we might be actually stopping the behaviors that we want I think there's another thing that we can do as well which is create a different energy in the system so on the whole at the moment it comes from HR but there's been some really interesting research so if we train individuals up and help them to create an energy for this that can be a great force as well. So if we train individuals up to know how to have great conversations about their career with their line manager, that can have more impact in terms of good quality career conversations than training the managers. So thinking about it much more widely, and I think I've probably used the word system quite a few times, thinking across the whole system to say what's going on and where can we leverage to set it up to for the behaviors that we want to encourage you mentioned long-term thinking requires a lot of patience however uh, what i see at least it's, it's it's a huge pressure from the stock market where corporate executives see level i mean just look at tesla's tesla stock uh, surge in the in the last few weeks and of course the ceo compensation is tied to the stock price mm. so uh, top leaders and decision makers are incentivized to short-term thinking versus versus long-term gain and and that's and that's 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 off balance. It somehow needs to be resolved because, of course, talent management and people management takes time. Changing cultures, changing yeah. building organization takes time and patience. So, how do we manage these short-term incentives versus long-term view and long-term thinking and investing in people? And I, I think you know it's the same with any investment, isn't it? It's the same when you need to change your IT system because you don't get the return straight away when you build a new. If you're a retail organization and you, you invest in new buildings, 
or you invest in a new site or new product, it takes time. And in the same way that there are ways of, of accounting, of offsetting some of your investments for the future, perhaps we need to be looking smarter at looking at those sorts of things for organisations, because if you don't manage your risk from a people point of view, you won't have a business in the future. It totally makes sense. I fully agree. And while you've mentioned before that, hey, we need to look at, and there's no uh, talent scarcity, we need to look at it differently. Um, mm. However, uh, every uh, sort of confirmed research and, and report confirms that uh, there's a, there's a, a talent shortage is all time, is all time low, unemployment rate is all time low. And of course, technology has drastically changed the mm. way we work. Many companies are going through uh, some sort of digital transformation mm. and, and 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 the 2020 pwc research actually ceo's global survey confirms that only 18 percent of organizations are making significant progress when it comes to upskilling their people mm. reskilling their people to be to be ready for the new sort of digital world and um, their biggest struggle once they've done the upskilling uh they lose the people so mm. the competition try to <laughs> try to take them away so Retaining talent is, has, has always been and is, is, is still probably more than ever now. It's a big issue for mm. corporations going through transformation. In your view, how do you think talent liberation can answer the question and the challenge of talent retention? Yeah, and I think the first thing is going back to that partnership idea that actually, if you are genuinely asking people what they want and you're genuinely open to finding what the organization needs and what the individual wants actually then you've got long-term partnership and even if the person is going to go you get warning of it and they can leave as a good lever and certainly in professional services terms having a good lever is okay because they go out and they promote your brand elsewhere they may bring some business in what have you so we agree that it can be a problem to hold on to people partnership helps um, thinking about retention differently can help to say okay how can we make this work for us so we get ambassadors out there but it's also quite interesting when you looking at that pwc report it's quite frightening when you see you know 18 percent said retention was an issue but actually when i i like i'm sometimes a bit nerdy with data so i like to go in and say well, what's it actually what's what's underneath what's what's this data telling us and the way the question was worded was they had uh, i think it was six options and they had to choose three of them. No, there were nine options. They had to choose three of them. So actually, 18%, when they had to choose three out of nine, you'd expect sort of 11% would be on an average. You know, if, you, if it was just chance, it would be 11%. So we've got one 18%, but they were all sort of 7 to 18%. So it wasn't actually a real outlier in terms of being <coughs> a big problem. And you also, within the report, the organizations overall, that were had well-established upskilling programs were hugely positive. So there were sort of 45% of them were saying, yes, this is very effective, upskilling is very effective at talent retention and acquisition. And only 5% were saying it's, a, it's not effective. And 35% were saying, yeah, it's very effective at reducing skills gaps. So although the 18% are a concern, actually underneath that the overall impact in terms of you know i like to refer things back to competitive advantage and risk the overall impact was very very positive so it may be that that's a an unfortunate side effect but actually the overall impact is still very positive in terms of the talent acquisition and the retention the reducing the skills gap and lots of other things as well so it was great to see that it was um considered really helpful in terms of corporate culture productivity and innovation as well. So it's bringing lots of other side effects that they perhaps hadn't necessarily anticipated. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that we'll all get smarter at the upskilling as it becomes more at some part of something that more organizations are doing, we will start to share best practice and we will find ways of making it work well for, for the individuals and for the organization. So as again, lessons learned, whenever we see a piece of research, it's just worth scratching the surface a little bit and just look, look what's beyond the, what's behind those numbers, how are the questions phrased, and let's just not talk anything, but just really, just really try to, try to look at it from that, that point of view as well, from the science point of view and an analytics uh, point of view. So Maggie, it's an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much. And those of you interested, 
here's the book. You can order it now on, on, on Amazon and all, all, all major bookstores. From Talent Management to Talent Liberation, a practical guide for professionals, managers, and leaders. And of course, uh, Maggie will be there with us in Valencia at the Age of Congress. So you can come join us and meet Maggie in person. But of course, if you can't make it, then I, I assume, Maggie, you're open for uh, people approaching you on LinkedIn. How, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Uh, probably via LinkedIn is probably the best way. Good. So thank you so much, Maggie. And I hope everybody enjoyed today's edition of Hard Talk HR. And stay tuned for the next edition. If you enjoyed this conversation, just hit the subscribe button.